approach just a little bit. And so I, I handed out these notes and you can see on them they're a little different. We're going to have to kind of do an overview of a pretty good section of the book. But what we're overviewing is the speeches back and forth between Job and his good friends. And I decided to do that because what they're doing is we're going to we're going to see a lot of uh, similar statements between uh, particularly his friends. Now when we get to Elihu and he begins his long speech, he brings out some different things and we'll notice that. But the other uh, Bildad and Eliphaz, you know, they're not bringing a whole lot of different things to the table. Not that what they're saying isn't important because it's left for us and we need to we need to know it. Uh, but we're, we've got to cover some ground, and what we want, what I want us to focus on, the last two classes or the last four chapters, because that's when God enters into the uh, discussion, and what He has to say is by far vastly more important than what these three men have to say. And uh, what he's going to do is obviously he's going to vindicate Job and he's going to bring some great truths to the table uh, and uh, point out his greatness and he's going to talk about some things that uh, obviously we need, to, uh, we need to know. And so I thought that was probably going to be the best thing for us to do. <clears throat> and uh, so we'll, we'll look at it from that direction. And I put at the front of the notes uh, some of the material that we already covered just in the outline because that's part of the second cycle of speeches. But we've made it to Job's response uh, under letter D of uh, the second cycle of speeches. So that's really where we'll pick up because we, uh, we covered Eliphaz's second speech, uh, Job's response to that, and Bildad's uh, second speech. So that brings us to Job's response, beginning with chapter 19. Uh, what happened here is Job begins his response by, uh, with the, with the indication that he's crying out and he's not being heard. Well, in reality, that's what's been going on this whole time, isn't it? Job's been making responses and statements concerning his position and what's going on and how he's suffering. And it's as it were falling on deaf ears, right? He, he's talking about what's happening. And all he's getting in return is, Job, you're, you're this rank sinner. And if you would just repent of what you've been doing, living this live hypocrisy, God would continue to bless you or go back and bless you. And you could return to the position you were before all these terrible things began to happen. And I think as we look at the text, and, and you've read the text, and, and you'll pick up on this idea that I think Job, in this portion of the book, and this is a, almost middle way into the book, he's sunk to the lowest point that, that we find. Job has reached emotionally and uh, I, I don't know if we could say physically because he's, he, he reached his physical uh, low point probably at, at the very beginning and it, and it maintained that low point. But along with that, he, he kept trying to maintain his emotional level. But I think we see he's reached his emotional bottom. And... Uh, uh, it's just really pitiful when we when we look at it. And when he begins to speak, he doesn't even respond, really, to the statements that Bildad made. He's, it's, he's not even responding to him, but what he demands to know is, how much longer are you fellas going to afflict me? How much longer are you going to torment me in my affliction? Isn't it enough that I'm suffering, and you can see how I'm suffering. 
You're not blind. You can see what's going on here. You've been sitting with me however long you've been sitting with me. And isn't it enough what you're seeing that you don't have to pile on and make it worse? Because, you know, the old saying, and you know, you've heard people say, uh, well, I'm not going to tell you I told you so. Well, what did you just do? I told you so, right? And in essence, that's kind of what they've been telling him all this time. You know, they got there and they saw the situation and they began to say, well, I told you so. I told you so. You need to repent. And so as we continue into this situation and his response, he comes up with this beautiful statement that we love to hear, and we sing songs about it. And we see this in, in chapter 20, verse 29. He states that he knows his Redeemer lives. That's one of the most comforting thoughts that anyone can have. And he's been having this idea, though, he knows that this... Job doesn't think he's going to get out of this thing alive. He does not believe that he's going to recover physically. He doesn't believe he's going to recover financially. He doesn't think this is going to turn out good for him. But he knows that there is something on the other side of this because is he guilty? No, he's not. He knows he's not guilty. He knows he's innocent. And so God is not going to punish him in eternity for something he hasn't done. Now, he doesn't understand what's going on. But he knows that God is a just God. And for whatever reason God has, he's just in having his reasoning for this happening to him. Right? And so he's not blaming God in that regard. But he just doesn't understand. And he's making these statements out of ignorance. But he knows his Redeemer lives. And at some point, he is going to be redeemed. What an encouragement. See, Job is an encouraging book. And that's one of the reasons we have it. We go through life and we suffer terrible things sometimes. And some people suffer worse things than other people. You know, we can always say, well, some people are suffering worse than I am. Whatever our situation is, everybody suffers. But some people suffer much worse. Whether it's health or whether it's finances or whether it's emotionally, someone is suffering worse somewhere. But what do we know? My Redeemer lives. And so I can get beyond this. Because in reality, this life is very short. If we live to be a hundred, which is a long life in our time, that's very short. Now Job goes on to warn his friends. He warns them. He says, and he tells them that you better be careful because you are going to be punished for the treatment you're doling out to me. Be careful what you, what you say because you're going to receive that. Now that reminds me of a statement that we, that we read in the New Testament. Let me look that up. Jesus made this statement in Matthew chapter 7, verse 2. And I think this is very applicable to what Job's friends are saying to him. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. So be careful with what judgment you lay on someone. Now what he's talking about, he's not saying 
uh, you know, you can't make a judgment. And people misuse that. Judge not that you be not judged. That has been one of the most abused verses that's ever been abused. You know, you can't, you can't judge anyone. Well, the people that say that just made a judgment, right? You go on down further in, in, in Christ's uh, uh, sermon that He's preaching there and He talks about making righteous judgment, right? You have to make a righteous judgment. Well, that's not what Job's friends are doing and that's why He's warning them. You are going to be punished because of the treatment that you are giving me. And so, he's trying to allow them to think about what's happening. I know I'm going to be redeemed. And when I am redeemed, that means that you will be shown to have done wrong here. My Redeemer lives. Any comments, questions? All right. Zophar then steps up to the plate and he makes his speech and he makes a hasty uh, speech. It's almost, he, it's almost like he can't hold himself back. He has to make a, a quick reply and he does so, excuse me, he does so in anger. He can't hold himself back. He has to jump in there and he has to make a reply and <clears throat> He looks at Job now as, as an enemy. He is so angry with what Job is saying that he has to respond to him in anger. He has to be someone who has to be uh, defeated and put down because Job is not paying attention. So far as sitting back there with these other two and he's looking at this situation and he is so upset that Job is just not paying attention. He's ignoring them. <clears throat> and it has brought Zophar to a point of anger. Now, the general facts that Zophar is stating are true. But the application that he is making toward Job could not be further from the truth. They are inaccurate. Now, what are some of the 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 general facts that he's stating that are true. Well, will the evildoer eventually meet his fate? Sure. Sure he will. The evildoer will eventually meet his fate. Will the evildoer always meet his fate in this life? Why, surely not. You know, we've all known people who were ungodly and, and just apathetic toward God in all ways and and they've done very well in this life. You know, we can look at, uh, I mean, for instance, look at our political system. You can look at, look at our politicians and see that they're wealthy. They live to grand old ages because they're still in politics. Uh, uh, I, you know, I was reading uh, just the other day Diane Feinstein from California. They're wheeling her in in a wheelchair. She doesn't even know where she's at. Multi-millionaire. You know, she has the best of health care. You know, uh, she is one of the more ungodly people that you will ever come across. She's not receiving some kind of punishment in this life, and she's certainly an evildoer. You know, and she's just popped in my mind because I read about her in the news. So, uh, but will the evildoer eventually get what's coming to them? Sure they will. Sure they will. But what's Zophar trying to say? He's throwing that at Job and he's saying, Job, you're being punished in this life because you're an evildoer. You're getting what's coming to you. Well, that's not true. Zophar is making a general statement that doesn't apply to Job. Now, does the evildoer... Does he receive punishment in this life sometimes? Sure, because he makes uh, decisions that are uh, dangerous decisions. You know, an evildoer might decide to be a drug addict or drunkard or uh, uh, lead uh, any kind of a dangerous lifestyle that might lead to some type of a punishment physically in this life or lead him to finding himself in jail or suffering financial loss in some way. 
you know, uh, that could happen though to, to, to any number of people. What about the innocent person that the evildoer affects in this life that they had absolutely nothing to do with it? That happens all the time, doesn't it? And so the, the general statements that Zophar makes are true, but they're incorrectly applied to Job. Just because he is suffering doesn't mean he's evil. And so we get into the next chapter, chapter 21, and Job makes his response. And what Job is appealing now, he appeals for a sympathetic hearing. Now when we, <clears throat> we use this word hearing a lot of the time to me to mean something like a judicial hearing. I don't think that's what Job is intending right here. He, he means, I want a sympathetic hearing in the fact that hear me sympathetically. Listen to me for just a moment. They had failed to offer any kind of comfort. They came for the purpose of comforting their friend. So I think what Job is stating here in the first couple of verses of chapter 21 is just listen to me in silence for a few moments and show a little comfort. And he's, he's saying here, uh, if you want to continue to mock me after that, if that's your whole goal is to come here and mock me and, and accuse me and tell me what a hypocrite I am and what a rank sinner I am, you go ahead and do that. But can you give me a few moments of silence so I can state what's happening? Can you give me that much compassion? Just give me a compassionate hearing. And so I think that's what Job is, is getting at here in his initial response here in the first six verses. And then we come to this idea, and we don't hear this terminology a lot, and we'll talk about it, but it, this is really what it is. It's retribution theology. Retribution theology. Now here's what retribution theology is. Retribution theology is that the, the wicked always receive their just reward in this life. And that's what their friends this whole time have been talking about. And so Job uh, considers that. And that's what this, this passage considers. The wicked seem to prosper and are blessed. Job talks about that. He says, what you're talking about can't possibly be true. And, he t and, and Job talks about and gives examples of the wicked seemingly being blessed and thriving and uh, not being punished in this life. And, you know, we look back through the history of the Old Testament and we can see uh, wicked nations, kings and, and other nations thriving in this life. And in fact, hasn't God used powerful nations to punish his own people? Well, if, if they were going to be powerful nations, how did they get to be powerful nations in the first place? God made them powerful, didn't he? Does that mean that he endorsed their wickedness? Absolutely not. They were tools. God allowed them to become powerful. That doesn't mean he endorsed their wickedness. In fact, they knew what God expected out of them. They just chose not to do it. Now, would they later on be punished for that? Sure they would. But this, this retribution theology is, is an absolute false theology. And, and then he goes on to say that the wicked are, in fact, often not punished in this life. You know... Uh, and, and in fact, we need to look at it this way. Eventually, these nations would be punished, but the individuals who would come up and rule over these nations, that would happen for hundreds of years, wouldn't it? But 
Did all of these kings that come up, did all of them, did they have one king that ruled for that entire span of time? No. They would come up and live and live very prosperous lives and die. Another one would come up and live a very prosperous life and die. Well, eventually, one would come up and be living and reigning and then that nation would be punished and destroyed. Okay. Well, eventually they would be punished, but what about all those folks for all that period of time that lived very prosperously and, and wickedly and were not punished? So not everyone who is wicked is punished in this life. And they may not be punished ever in this life, but eventually they will be punished. And it's just like Job said. I may not receive a blessing in this life, but I know my Redeemer lives, right? We go back to uh, the rich man in Lazarus. How many blessings did the beggar Lazarus receive in this life? Well, we don't have any recorded for us, right? I don't know what he received when he was a younger man, but what's recorded for us, he had no blessings in this life recorded, but boy, did he receive those blessings when he went into the next life. And so uh, we see that that works both ways, doesn't it? And so there were, there were blessings beyond what he could even imagine in the next life and punishment beyond what you think you could ever endure in the next life, though you think that you have it all in this life. So the friends indicated the wicked always receive punishment. Well, that's not true. And then it... Toward the end of chapter 27, we see Job anticipated the rebuttal that was coming. He knew that what he was saying, just as their mindset was, he knew that that was falling on deaf ears. They weren't going to pay any attention to him. But now notice the difference between Job's speeches and his friend's speeches. They're throwing out all kinds of accusations. In general, they're throwing out accusations. Job, you're a sinner. You're a hypocrite. But how much evidence were they bringing to the table? They didn't have anything, did they? Job, they didn't have anything that said, Job, you've done this, 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 and this. Just in general, they were saying, Job, you've got to be a sinner or these terrible things wouldn't happen to you. Job is very uh, rationally and reasonably setting forth uh, the truths that as far as he knows them and he's laying those out now there's a lot of things Job's not aware of at this time and he speaks out of turn a little bit in his idea that God is the force behind this but in general he recognizes God is the sovereign of all things he recognizes that the wicked can go unpunished he recognizes he's innocent and he recognizes that his Redeemer lives. So Job has a pretty good handle on things. And he's very reasonable in articulating his arguments. His friends are not. And so he is anticipating their rebuttal, but they have no evidence whatsoever when they go to accuse Job of anything. Any comments? Questions? Well, I think so. I think Job, and, and the question is, is it a good book on learning how to comfort? <clears throat> I think there are different ways we learn. Okay? We can learn from the Bible by example of how someone is doing something and we follow that example. And we can learn by what not to do. Okay? And Job is, I think, that example. When we're trying to learn, uh, we're, say we, we're looking at a verse and we're dissecting a passage and we're trying to determine what a passage means. Okay? And uh, I'm, I'm trying to think of one that, that fits this well. Uh, it's not coming to me right off. Let's say, for example, Paul is talking to the Corinthians and uh, he's talking about the resurrection. Uh, 
and uh, he's talking about baptizing those for the dead. Can anyone think of where that is right off the, the bat? I can't think of that, but it's in it's in uh, uh, in one of his letters. I think it's in First Corinthians. He's talking about the resurrection, and he is saying because they uh, the false teachers are are claiming there's no resurrection, and his statement is, well, and I'm paraphrasing, if there is no resurrection, why do they baptize those who have died? Okay, and. There, uh, the Mormon Church have built a whole doctrine on that statement. You know where that is? Chapter fifteen, verses twelve through nineteen. Okay, chapter uh, uh, first Corinthians fifteen, beginning with twelve, chapter uh, verse twelve. Okay, so that's our that's our location, and um, so we're trying to figure out what that means. And you know, well, can you baptize someone who has died? Well, you know, you're 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 uh, uh, studying with someone who maybe is not a Christian or is a brand new Christian, and we're trying to determine what does that passage mean. Well, sometimes you have to start with what does it not mean, okay? And uh, so, first of all, we start with it can't mean that you can baptize yourself for someone who has died previously, and here's why. Well, first of all, you have to be a believer. And if you're dead, you cannot be a believer because first, you're dead. Okay? Your mind has gone on. Okay? Uh, Solomon said those who are dead know nothing about what's going on under the sun. That means here on earth. And that's just an example. And I say that to say this. Uh, you look at something and you say, okay, that's not how we want to behave, or that's not what we want to believe. So you figure out, okay, that's not what it means, so now I have to figure out what it does mean. And Job is an example of, I believe, not to be like his friends. They're not comforting him in the proper way. Okay? You don't, you don't go up to someone who has suffered a loss or who, or who maybe even has made a mistake. And the way to comfort someone who's made a mistake or the way to even rebuke someone who's made a mistake is by to say, I told you so. Right? That's not the way. Do, do we need to rebuke people? Sure we do. Sure we do. That's the whole idea of preaching the gospel. To reprove, to rebuke, to exhort. I, think, I don't think those are separate sermons. I think those are, that's, those are aspects of sermons. Okay? So you have to exhort and encourage along with that rebuking and to just to come up and, and tell someone, well, I told you so. That's not encouragement. That's not lifting them up, right? Uh, Romans chapter 8, I preached Sunday on that. In one aspect of, of um, Romans chapter 8 is encouragement, okay? And, you know, and last night we were talking about Zechariah, you know, and his encouragement to the people to build the temple. Build that temple and he, he encouraged them. And we all need encouragement. And so they were absolutely going the wrong way about it. And so I think, uh, Lauren, you're correct that I think this is a good example of how to do, how, how to be encouraging to people by not following this example. You know, and we see throughout the New Testament uh, Paul talked to, uh, talked about, uh, you know, follow me as I follow Christ. You, uh, you know, we can be examples to people if we are the correct example. Peter said Jesus was our example. Follow his example. I don't recall him behaving this way toward anybody. Now, could he be, could he be pretty straightforward and blunt? Sure he could. You know, what about John the Baptist? Could he be straightforward and blunt? You're a bunch of hypocrites and snakes. Repent. Now, you know, each situation demands a certain tactic, right? And so we have to be able to read the person and read the room and understand what that tactic is and, and use tact.
That doesn't mean we water down the gospel, but that means we present it in love in the correct manner. And sometimes, uh, uh, you know, a rebuke in love is necessary. But that's a, that's a good comment. Anything else? All right. Well, let's notice this third cycle of speeches, beginning with chapter 27. Uh, Eliphaz's uh, third speech. Uh, uh, let's see. I guess I put the I put the wrong um, chapter. Uh, it's not twenty seven. 22 uh, under uh, point 2. It should be 22. Uh, let's do 27. But anyway, Eliphaz's uh, third speech begins in uh, chapter 22. Now he charges Job with the question asking him, is he a benefit to God? In other words, he's saying, can you live in such a way, Job, as to put God in an obligation to you. Can you live in such a way as to obligate God to bless, excuse me, to bless you, to be good to you? Well, that's a ridiculous question. That's a foolish question. Uh, 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 no one can live in such a way as to obligate God to you, right? God is obligated to no person. We cannot, that, that's this idea of, of uh, working your way to heaven, right? Uh, all works and, uh, uh, you know, that's, that's almost like a, a, a Catholic doctrine. You work your way or buy your way into heaven. Uh, no one can do that. And uh, uh, his conclusion toward Job is, if you cannot do that, then God is going to bring this judgment upon you. And you are in the throes of this judgment right now. Well, Eliphaz is just a, a, a ridiculous person. He, he should have been ashamed of himself. And, and what we notice here as this continues on, have you ever, uh, if you've ever in school or anywhere else ever taken a debate class, and one of the things they teach you is uh, when a person uh, runs out of soap in a debate, they eventually, and you've seen this probably in debates, if you watched any type of a political debate or anything else, when a person runs out of soap, what then do they begin to attack? The person. They begin to attack the person. And that is what we have seen in this whole process with Job and his friends. They began first, you know, they started out real, really soft with Job, you know, kind of trying to, to be easy with him. And as time has progressed, they started getting more firm with him and tougher with him. And now we have Eliphaz saying, Job, can you not live in such a way as to obligate God to bless you? If you can't do that, then you deserve what you're doing. Well, that that's a, that is just beyond ridiculous. That is a, in fact, that's a stupid statement. And in essence, that's what Eliphaz is saying to Job. You can't be so righteous, Job, that God is not able to punish you in some way, ever. I mean, that statement alone, uh, Eliphaz deserves punishment for even considering something like that. And then, of course, he calls Job to repentance. You know, that's the pot calling the kettle black. And then uh, in chapter 23, we move into Job's response. He said, uh, and it's a, it's a response of confidence. And now we see what we see in Job is he's kind of coming out of this, uh, if we can say he's coming out of it, but he's kind of coming out of this, this lowest of low, uh, spot that he was in. But what he, what even at this point, what he's begun to do is just simply ignore. He's ignoring these statements and these speeches. He's not even really paying attention to them anymore because they've gone into the absurd. You know, and, and that's kind of what people do, isn't it? When, when someone begins to speak so absurdly, you just kind of tune them out. You know, it's not even worth your time and effort to even listen to them because it holds no substance in reality. And that statement that Eliphaz made was, was beyond 
uh, anything Job ought to even pay attention to. No one's going to live in such a way as to obligate God to them. What are you even talking about? But Job begins to ignore these speeches, and so now it's almost as if he's just directly speaking to God. He wants to present his case directly to God. It's, it's like he's falling upon his mercy. And so in the following two chapters, Job is practically ignoring life as, and he continued to lament, uh, lament that he could not reach God. And he remained disturbed, and he's, he's really bothered that God has allowed him to suffer and for the wicked to prosper. And so he's still recognizing, well, the wicked can prosper and the innocent can suffer. Now he is seeing that while his friends are completely oblivious to the fact that the wicked can prosper. You know, uh, they're prospering pretty good, aren't they? They're not having any issues, doesn't seem to me. So we're having a pretty good contrast right here at home that they're doing pretty well. And so uh, uh, he was innocent. And in his mind, if he could just present his case to God, he could be vindicated. He was confident of that. And now his enemies could see it. And I don't think, I think that, that we've seen a change in the dynamic. I don't think he's viewing these men any longer as friends of his. You know, I think that train left. Now they're his enemies. And they're viewing him as an enemy. And we see the goodness of Job. We see this great character in Job. How many of you have ever been so sick and felt so bad you just had to lay in bed and you just, you just could hardly raise your head? I mean, I think we've all probably been there. How many of us in that position would put up with three people sitting around your bed talking to you this way? For about 10 seconds. Long enough for me to say, call the police. Get these fools out of here. And we see the goodness of Job and his great character. And we're, it's even going to shine through more later on when Job offers sacrifice for them. You know, how many people would be calling down uh, hellfire and brimstone from heaven like James and John on the Samaritans, right? And uh, But that just shows you what a great individual this man is. He is just to be held up. So we move into chapter 25. Any comments, questions? Well, we come to Bildad. Chapter 25, his third speech. It's very short. And it appears that uh, his desire for debate is gone. Uh, Job has uh, maybe outlasted him a little bit. But he begins to argue for the majesty of God. He argues against the importance of humanity through a series of rhetorical questions. Uh, some have used uh, verse 4 of chapter 25 to try to prove the false doctrine of original sin. Uh, you know, how can, uh, how can you be cleansed? Uh, things of that nature. But now here's what we have to remember. Job is a poem for the most part. Okay? Job is a poem. Uh, and when a speech is poetic, you cannot use poetic speech to contradict literal language. Okay, so, uh, you know, poetic speech will often use figurative type speaking uh, in its, in its uh, language, okay? So we cannot, uh, in fact, let's just go ahead and read that. Uh, how then can man be justified with God? Or how can he be clean that is born of a woman? Okay. Well, again, he's using um, uh, poetic speech there. And uh, uh, we can't contradict 
uh, 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 literal language. And what he's getting at anyway is how can a man justify himself? That's, that's the jab he's making at Job. He's not saying you're born in sin. He's just poetically stating, how can you justify yourself? How can you make yourself clean? You're a person born of a woman. You're a human. That's the point he's making. Uh, he, and, and compared to God, remember he's, he's uh, uh, holding up God as this, and rightly so, as a majestic being. And he's comparing Job to him, and he's saying, Job, compared to God, you're unclean. So how can you justify yourself? And he's just putting it in a poetic form. And so we can't use this to, to teach some sort of uh, uh, Calvinism. And that, that's, a, that's a real reach for him to try to, uh, for, for a person to try to do that. He also used uh, creation showing how much greater God is. And, and he speaks of, of the body of a person returning back to the elements. And, and that's what happens. A person, a person dies and his body returns back to the dust. And Solomon spoke of that. And the spirit returns back to God for safekeeping until uh, the last day. But what he fails to recognize and what he fails to mention is there's another part of man of a person, right? There's more than just this outside body that returns back to the elements because we are made in the image of God. And what is it about a person that is made in the image of God? Do we look like God physically? I mean, do we have the same color eyes? and Are we the same height? You know, uh, when you look at Lauren's children, you can tell what, what uh, uh, family she's uh, her children came from, can't you? You sure can. So is that how we're made in the image of God? No. You know, I had a friend of mine tell me one time, he said, boy, your girls look just like you. But it just looks better on them. <laughs> I said, thank you so much. <laughs> I mean, you know, he wasn't lying. What can I say? But uh, uh, so, how are we made in the image of God? How are we in His likeness? And Bildad left that part out. He was just talking about this physical part. We have a spiritual part to us, don't we? We have a part to us, and that spiritual part is where the seat of our emotion is, right? It's our mind, it's our memory. When we sit around the, the fellowship table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that's who we are. In eternity, right? When we go into eternity and we can recall who people are, just like the rich man remembered who uh, Lazarus was, and he could recognize Abraham, and and uh, you know when when on the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter, James, and John they saw Elijah and they saw Moses and they knew who those men were. You know we will be able to do that. Isn't that comforting to know that? That there are people who have gone on before us that we love and, 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 and we miss. And when we go into eternity, if we are found faithful, that we can be reunited and we can say, I love you and I have missed you. See, Bill Dad left that out. He's talking about this old physical part that hurts every morning when we get up and and you know, and, and man, my right shoulder's hurting, and I need to go get another injection in my back so I can walk right again. And you know, I'm sick of that. But one day, this spiritual part of us who that is eternal, that part that does go back to God for safekeeping, and then on that last day, when Jesus returns and he brings all of those folks who have gone into uh, uh, the Hayden realm into paradise to bring them back so there can be a resurrection. Bildad didn't talk about that. See, he wanted to talk about this old physical body. This isn't who we are. Who we are is the seat of our emotion, our, our spiritual part of us. Yeah, well, when we think of someone, we look at the, you know, what pops in our mind, the physical look, right? But really, who we are is our personality, isn't it? That's who we are. Bildad left all that out. And Job responded. 
And he responded, I think rightly so, sarcastically. He said, he asked, he said, uh, how have you helped me? You, you've given these great speeches, but how have you really helped me? Bildad said the dominion of God extended to the heavens. Job said it extended into the afterlife, the nether regions, the Hayden realm. Sheol in the Old Testament. That's what Job was talking about. You are limiting God's abilities, Bildad. God has ability beyond what you even can recognize. His power goes into the afterlife. Job illustrated the greatness of God in verse 7 of chapter 26. And that's one of the one of the prime verses I want us to, to always remember uh, when we're talking to people who try to uh, discredit the Bible. The earth is hung upon nothing. Now how in the world would Job have known that? This was way before we've had any kind of a telescope or, or anything else. How did he know that the, there was an empty space in the north of the sky where no stars are? There were no telescopes when, when Job was uh, living. You know, I've, I've written down here some very interesting facts uh, and also these, these extra verses that talk about us, talk about the, the circular shape of the earth and how the earth spins. Gravity keeps us in the, uh, out in the space so we're not falling. But we, when we read that, we see the earth depicted as a large spinning ball in space. Well, who would have thunk it, Right? There we are, spinning in space uh, on a tilted axis. Uh, you know, uh, the empty space toward the north and the, the uh, 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 I started to say astrologers. The astronomers uh, have established that, that there are no stars to the north in, in one spot. Job would not, not have known that had God not told him that. Inspiration of the Bible. Inspiration of the Bible. Whenever Job was written, it was written before any human could have known that. Right? Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, that is just an amazing, an amazing uh, uh, information there. Now, uh, I've got written, oh yeah, up above that. Uh, uh, the Egyptians said that the earth was supported by five great pillars one under each corner. I guess the earth was a cube at that time and the fifth under the middle. Of course, we all remember Atlas. The Greeks said that the earth was supported upon Atlas, but you know, who was holding up Atlas? Yeah. Uh, we mentioned this, or I mentioned this the other day. I left a little part of it out. I had forgotten this part. The ancient Hindu uh, said that the earth was balanced on the back of a great elephant. The elephant stood on the back of the great turtle. The turtle was swimming in a cosmic sea. I mean, amazing. Amazing. But you know what? That's more believable than uh, the pillars and the and Atlas. At least there's a sea. I guess there could be a great sea, cosmic sea out there somewhere. Uh, but anyway, uh, after, uh, you know, Job knew all those truths, and it seems after Job spoke that, that, that Zophar had run out of soap, and he really didn't have anything to offer, so Job just kept talking. And uh, he began, uh, Job began this section of his speech affirming the, the, the rightness of what he was about to say. And he made this statement beginning in chapter 27, uh, as God liveth. Now, of course, that meant I'm going to tell the truth here. He swore an oath, right? Now, the connection between chapters 28 and 27 seemed to be one uh, uh, between the uh, uh, that the conf uh, Job's confidence that the wicked will be punished, but the matter of when and how is left up to God, right? That's that's God's business. And uh, God works on a timetable, but, but that timetable is His timetable, right? He's coming back on His timetable. 
He punishes on His timetable. He blesses on His timetable. He answers prayers on His timetable. God operates on His timetable, right? And so uh, we may look at things and think that that God is is inconsistent, but He's not. And Job talks about wisdom in this chapter. And the, the bottom line to this is there's only one place to gain wisdom. That's from God. And we learn that in the New Testament, in particularly in the book of James. Right? If you seek wisdom or you want wisdom, ask God who gives it liberally. Now we have to do some work on our part to gain that, right? We have to study. We have to search it out. We have to seek it. Right now, uh, we're here at the very end, and if you just give me a few extra minutes, we'll finish this up. Eli, Elihu's speeches, uh, 32 through 37. Uh, they're long, but we're just going to look at the basic parts of them. Elihu here functions as God's forerunner, meaning he came right before God spoke. Now, Elihu was a young man, he was younger than those who were already there, the three friends. And he sat in silence before he spoke uh, as a sign of respect towards these men. And he listened. And uh, uh, he didn't speak until he viewed it as his turn to speak. And uh, when he did speak, he was angry. He was angry because he felt like these three friends did not answer Job's arguments. And so he was angry toward those three men. And so he was irritated with everybody sitting around wherever they were sitting. And so uh, his position here is between Job's oath of innocence and God's answer. And that helps kind of prepare for God's appearance. And the content of his speeches kind of uh, prepares the way for God's answers, the things that he states. So the, the basic message of Elihu's speeches are twofold. God disciplines people to turn from the error of their ways, and God governs justly without exception. Okay? And uh, I think we can agree with that. Now, Elihu differs from uh, the three friends in these ways. He does not assume all suffering is punishment for sin. He teaches that uh, misfortune may happen to kind of wake people up from doing wrong. Uh, or uh, from their unconsciousness of doing wrong. Either they're doing it intentionally or they're unconsciously doing it, and it's to kind of wake them up from that and to keep them out of the wrong course of action. He also acknowledged suffering may be a way God expresses mercy rather than wrath. And then he addressed uh, more the core message of the book, which one of the core messages of the book is how the righteous should respond to suffering. How do we respond when we suffer? Do we blame God? Because he's to blame when we suffer? Well, no, that's not the correct response. And so he, he addressed how the righteous should respond to suffering. So he's acknowledging righteous people can suffer. And then finally, Elihu stressed the sovereignty of God. And uh, he presented some insight into God's use of suffering. Any comments, questions? All right. Now, next time we're going to try to uh, uh, break the last four chapters into two chapters per uh, class, and so we'll be able to spend a little more time with what God's having to say here. So it'll be very interesting. Yes.